I remember being so excited. A little over 15 years ago, my then girlfriend, now wife, Bethany and I, decided to visit my favorite place on the face of the planet, Walt Disney World. It was our first time going together and I was so pumped to share in all of the experiences with her. The shows, the parades, and of course the rides. It was all going so incredible. We were making our way through all of the rides at Epcot Center and the time came to go on Mission Space. Now, if you've never been on Mission Space, it's an intense ride that simulates a journey into outer space. You sit in a tightly enclosed pod of four people and each person has a specific role to complete a mission critical sequence during the experience. There's the commander, the pilot, the engineer, and the navigator. The pilot, for instance, has to press a button to activate manual flight control and then steer the shuttle. The commander has to initiate hypersleep and so forth. So we crawled into our pod and the door closes behind us and the controls and the screen are lowered directly in front of us. I guess this might be the moment where I should tell you that before going on the ride, Bethany had told me that she gets claustrophobic really easily. And I assured her, oh, it, it's not that bad. Well, anyways, the, the ride starts and the moment comes where I, as the engineer, needed to press the button to initiate takeoff. I complete this objective with textbook precision. And it's actually quite remarkable how the Disney Imagineers effectively use the sensation of G-forces to simulate blasting off. It's really intense. A little later on in the ride, we got to Bethany's moment to shine. She was the commander and she had to press the button to initiate the rocket's first stage separation once we were in orbit. Failure to complete this task would have catastrophic repercussions to the rest of our mission. So I call over, now Bethany, release the rocket. Bethany, she wasn't doing what she needed to be doing, in fact, she wasn't moving at all. So I looked over at her and her eyes were tightly closed and she was trying to control her breathing. She wasn't moving a muscle. I think if she did, she would have puked all over everything. Thankfully, the ride's autopilot took over for our incapacitated commander and initiated the task so we wouldn't fail our mission. For the rest of the ride though, I was more concerned with how I was gonna explain my way out of the doghouse. The ride ended and we shuffled out back into the Florida sunlight. Bethany kept her eyes closed almost the whole time trying to regain her composure. When she started talking to me again in, in a few hours, she said that if I ever made her do anything like that again, not only would our mission fail, but so would our relationship. Luckily, she forgave me and still agreed to marry me in the end. See, Bethany has a very large set of giftings, but having the talents and responsibilities of a commander was not in her wheelhouse. Thankfully, I know it's probably in someone else's. Remembering this story got me thinking, how has God gifted me? How has God gifted you? And furthermore, why does it seem everyone is so unique in their gifting? What even is a gift and what is its purpose? We can classify this in, in two ways. First, there are what we can call natural talents. These are the things that we're just naturally good at. Perhaps they are genetic or a factor of our environments. We can develop and grow and practice these talents. It could be that you're naturally good at sports or music or art or engineering. See, then there are what the Bible calls spiritual gifts. These are the gifts given to us when we give our lives to Christ by grace through faith. The apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, lists some of these gifts in three different letters that he writes to three different churches. In his letter to the church in Rome, Paul lists the spiritual gifts of prophesying, serving and teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, and showing mercy. 
in his letter to the church in Ephesus, Paul lists being apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, pastors, and helpers. In his letter to the Corinthians, he lists the gifts of wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miraculous powers, and speaking in tongues. These gifts that Paul lists are specific to the needs of the churches that he's writing to. There are multiple lists, each with different gifts. Therefore, it's understood that these aren't exhaustive lists. There are many more spiritual gifts. As followers of Jesus... As God pursuers, scripture tells us that we are given spiritual gifts. What then are we to do with them? In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, Paul lays it out pretty clearly for us. He says, God has given us these gifts so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Did you catch that? When we are using our gifts to love and care for the world, we are becoming mature. We are growing as gift users. We are called to seek God's guidance, to uncover, utilize, and grow the gifts with which we've been equipped. This starts with a posture of humbleness and prayer. So let us come before God and simply ask him to reveal how you've been wired. What are those key attributes that have been given and gifted specifically to you? Another way we can uncover our gifts is to ask others that know us. It's really hard to see specific qualities in ourselves Sometimes it's easier for others to share their observations and identify where we might be excelling. Next, think about what your passions are. What do you enjoy doing? Oftentimes our passions and our gifts intersect in this sweet spot. Lastly, maybe to uncover our gifts, we should just jump in and get involved and start serving. Sometimes you don't know what you're good at until you start doing it and you try it. Start serving and be open to lots of things and trying new experiences. Once we identify our talents and God-given gifts, we need to then commit to opportunities to offer them to serve others as Jesus did. We're expected to use our gifts. Have Have you ever been so excited to give someone that perfect gift that you picked out just for them? only to come to their house a few weeks later and the gift is still sitting in the same spot where they opened it and gathering dust. I feel this must be how God views our neglect of the perfectly picked out gifts that he gives to us when we don't use them. If we're not actively using it, we can lose it. It's like a muscle. We're all called to practice and grow in our gifting. I think it's kind of like working out. See, I had been on an exercise journey for the past year where I was lifting weights for endurance strength building. Well, a few months back, I got thrown off of my rhythm and I haven't really lifted a weight since. And I can feel and I can see how my muscle definition has deteriorated. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says that God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Notice who has really given the gift. We need to realize that it's not us, but Christ in us. Our gifts are used to worship God and are given for the sole purpose of his church, not for our personal gain. See, this is where it can get real sticky. If we get this part wrong, we can start thinking that our talents and gifts are all about us and how great we are. I'm the best singer. I'm such a good cook. I have great business smarts. My time is so valuable. This is where the stronghold of pride can rear its ugly head and sink its claws into us. 
but we are called to be stronghold breakers. So we have to be clear that we don't own this gift. Even though we have the gift, we do not own it. Additionally, we are given different gifts in different seasons according to the work that God is doing through us. The Bible says that we're called to be good stewards of these gifts. Pastor Rick Warren puts it like this. He says, if you think your talents are simply for you to make a lot of money, to retire and die, well, then you've missed the point of life. Your talents and unique abilities are God's gift to you. How and when you use them is your gift back to God. Because of this, no matter your age or how long you've been a Christ follower, there is no sitting on the bench or the sideline if you're living a life of faith and growing as a God pursuer and gift user. The one thing we can't do is bury or deny our God-given gifts. Romans chapter 12, verses four through six says, just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body, meaning the church. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. We each have a specific role to play, and we're dependent on each other. My wife and kids love to do puzzles. I don't know about you, I don't really have the patience because nothing is more frustrating than missing a piece of the puzzle. And let's face it, it's easy to lose a puzzle piece. Perhaps it gets stuck to your palm and then it falls on the carpet and then it miraculously finds its way to that mysterious realm with all the other missing puzzle pieces and individual socks. When you don't have a piece to the puzzle, the finished product is incomplete. It's missing a unique, one-of-a-kind piece that is the only thing that can fill in that gap in the puzzle. All the other pieces of the puzzle are counting on that piece too. Unlike mission space, there is no autopilot that will do your role for you. See, the kingdom of God is like a giant puzzle made up of individual pieces that are as unique as each of our fingerprints. No two are the same. If you're not using your God-given gifts and talents in this world, well, then the world is missing an important piece that you can fill. In addition to this, Christ calls us to be relationship builders There would be a Ryan-sized gap in the puzzle of the kingdom of God if it weren't for some really trusted friends in my life who saw something in me that I couldn't see in myself. I sought out so many other paths for my life. I have a degree in film production, and I also have a master's in education. Yet even those paths led me to right where I am today. See? Film and teaching. But it's because of my strong relationships within the faith community that I'm using the gifts that God has equipped me with. Therefore, as we seek to have others tell us the giftings that they see in us, we are to tell others the way that we see they are gifted. There is no room for jealousy or for ego We shouldn't be threatened by someone else's gifts because we want to hoard the credit for ourselves. We should be encouraging and calling out the gifts in others. The four most important letters in the alphabet when they're put together are I, C, and you. I see in you the gifting of hospitality or I see in you the gifting of empathy. We should actively be training our eyes to see the gifts in others and to tell them. We're called to invite everyone to walk together in the calling of Christ for a life of eternal impact. 
The great commission that Jesus gives us to go and make disciples is a commission that requires community. We should be using our time and our God-given gifts and abilities to serve others and advance his kingdom. God cares more about our availability than our ability. When you live into your calling as a gift user, you are in full-time ministry. It's just in a different setting than a church building. Let's not put our ministry in a box that's only taken out for one hour every week on Sunday mornings. I want to be clear about this. This is not just on the backs of church staff. It's not reliant solely on your attendance at a worship service. Being a gift user is a 24-7 lifestyle. If you're a handy person, make yourself available in your community to serve the elderly. Help with rebuilding together Aurora. See, this is not my gifting, at least currently, and my wife always reminds me of this. When something breaks in our house, we need to call our repair guy who's gifted in that. So we call my dad. If you're a teacher, offer to set up tutoring groups in your neighborhood. If you're a good cook or good with hospitality, organize and participate in meal planning and serving at food pantries. If you're good with finances, help share knowledge of good practices to those around you. Serve on church council. Lead a financial peace university small group. If you're artistic, there are plenty of opportunities to use photo and video, graphic and music skills here. I mean, this is just barely beginning to scratch the surface of diving into the vastness of spiritual gifts. There is still so much more to unpack and discover. As Christ's church though, let's commit to maturing together as gift users. Are our hands open to receive, to use, and to grow the gifting that God has given us for a life of eternal impact in Jesus' name? Let's pray. God, you are a gift-giving God. And we thank you for the ways in which you equip us for the purpose of building your church here on this earth. Lord, through the power of your spirit, we, we ask for your guidance, for your wisdom and your leading so that in all ways and in every way, God, we are using our gifts and talents to be your hands and feet to a world that so desperately needs us, your church, your people. Let them know us by our love. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty, powerful name. Amen.